Well, it is finally here, the final episode of Dragon Ball Super. Although I obviously still have the first three arcs of this series to cover, alongside the original three series and the upcoming movie, there's still this air of finality to this near three year long shared experience watching this show. We've seen the series struggle to keep afloat during its early days, going through five series directors and regularly falling to pieces during critical moments. It has been an exceptional exceptionally bumpy road on the production side of things, and while this arc still had to rely very heavily on reused animation, the jump in quality across the board has been almost impossible to miss. While I have many an issue with the writing side of things, I never thought they would be able to pull off a tournament like this. We just went through 34 episodes of action with only the odd hiccup, and they really nailed this finale. As a result, I want to take a moment before diving into things to really just say a big thank you to everyone everyone who has worked on the show. We've heard countless anecdotes about how insanely tough it is to deal with Super's schedule, but each and every one of the staff on the show has really gone to their limits to ensure this series could wrap up in a polished and memorable way, and I think they succeeded. The director of this episode, Megumi Ishitani, had been tweeting a lot during the build-up to her debut here, talking about how exhausted she is and waking up at 3am to work on the show and being totally unable to even watch episode 1 30 due to just how insanely busy she was finishing the episode. Ishitani is an incredibly young, incredibly special director. She attended the Tokyo University of the Arts and managed to make her way into the most prestigious program in Japan, the Geidai Animation Program, which only admits about a dozen or so students a year. Toei might get a lot of criticism, but one thing they're very good at is fostering young talents, and that is 100% true of Ishitani. She graduated that program in 2015 joined Super in 2016 by directing the fifth ending, and then the seventh ending in 2017. She has been an assistant director on the vast majority of episodes in this tournament, and was then granted the opportunity to direct the finale of the show. I don't think the significance of that can be understated. From graduating school to directing the finale of one of the biggest shows in the world within three years is astounding, and her direction and storyboard in this episode is 10 out of 10. This is far and away the best thing Super has ever seen. Whenever I've touched on direction and storyboarding in the past, I've almost always approached it from the perspective of, is this interesting to look at, and does each scene actually have the gravitas it deserves? And that's a totally fine way of looking at things, but it's really a very surface level judgement of quality. A storyboard, as the name implies, should service the narrative, it should be clear and direct in what it aims to do, and the framing, lighting choices and music placement should all reflect that wholeheartedly, while of course, like I've been talking about for weeks upon weeks, also be very dynamic and interesting. There are a lot of things to juggle, and I think Ishitani absolutely nailed it. While it's really interesting to see the narrative sensitive framing of Jiren change from looming and powerful to weak and wasted, it's the readability of these opening action scenes that I think is most impressive in this half. In the past, I've complimented boards for making action feel really dynamic by having characters come in and out of the frame, but nobody until now has done that across such a huge space while also giving the audience 100% awareness of where everyone is within the arena. This action scene comes from Masahiro Shimanuki, albeit quite heavily corrected by our supervisor here, the series over Chief of Animation, Tadayoshi Yamamuro. He's corrected away pretty much all of Shimanuki's awkward poses and the resulting stiffness, and the final scene is pretty competently executed. If there's one thing Shimanuki's always been good at, it's drawing Freezer. 
Again, it's the structure that's the strongest here. We've got Frieza coming in as 17 gets knocked away. He falls through the floor with Jiren before it cuts to show where 17 is again before popping back to Jiren and Frieza's interaction. It's a tiny detail, but it's such an important one as it frames exactly how far away 17 is. So by the time he pops back into the fight, the audience isn't left wondering what he was doing all of this time. Again, it's this careful consideration of the narrative that sets this storyboard apart from all of the others. It's so readable and you'll see this extend throughout every single bit of action here. Another part of the direction that's so strong is the use of colour. Back on Dragon Ball Z, there was a director, Yoshihiro Ueda, who was so famous for utilising colour to emphasise scenes that the background artists used to absolutely hate him for making their life so difficult. Ishitani has really brought that approach back to the series in a big, big way. As Frieza looms over Jiren, pointing a beam at him, there's this lovely mishmash of reds and purples, which not only looks great, but it helps to isolate Jiren from the surrounding area as he has his little reflective moment on what trust means. Shortly after, the arena is drenched in these oppressive reds as Jiren starts to push 17 and Freezer back, but that suddenly clears into this heavenly blue as Goku arrives and Sumitomo's heroic score kicks in. Again, every creative decision here doesn't exist just because. It exists because it has something to say, and for me, it's that love and care that makes this Super's best directed episode. As Goku and Freezer rush at Jiren, we get a scene from what looks to be Kenta Yokoya. The fact that he's continue to pop up on Super is still the weirdest thing to me. He debuted in episode 116 with a tiny scene following Kenotsuka's, and then again for Vegeta's Sacrifice 2.0. He's one of the industry's shining young stars and has done some spectacular work on currently airing shows like Darling in the Franks. This is probably his most interesting work on Super, although it's still very much an effects focused scene, it's kind of nice to actually get some character movement in there too. Of course, what follows is absolutely the star of the episode, and it's from fan favourite Yuya Takahashi. I think it pretty much speaks for itself. The snappy timing, the awesome effects work and impact frames, this is far and away his best work on Super. He appears to have been corrected by Tadayoshi Yamamura with most shots of Goku's face, lacking the typical traits that have led to Takahashi becoming a fan favourite. He's shown that he can stick to the character sheets when he wants, so perhaps this was intentional to better fit with everyone else, particularly since there are instances of indented cheek highlights of all things. But the fact is, when I can see 100% black hair, defined noses, and several layers of shading in the odd shot here and there, it does seem like Yamamura did step in. On the whole though, I do think Yamamura did a pretty decent job. I mean sure, I don't like his style much as you know, but it's hard to argue he's not extremely hard working. From start to finish, there's hardly a genuinely bad shot, and considering the likes of Masahiro Shimanuki and Yoshitaka Yashima contributed a great deal, and their typical iffy animation is nowhere to be found, it's clear his draconian approach to supervision does have its benefits when it comes to weaker animators. I hope people do remember that, since I do often feel like my complex opinions on him get twisted into just, he's bad and can't animate, when in reality it's that his approach to supervision is poor, and his style is very inconsistent and a little bit bland. If this is Yamamura's last episode in a prominent position, then I think it's definitely a nice way for him to go out. As we head into the second half, the action is of course over, but that doesn't mark the end of animation worth talking about. Super Shenlong granting the wish is handled wonderfully, although his summoning is skipped over, which honestly is probably a very good thing considering what happened last time, he is framed with real scale again thanks to Ishitani. As he grants the wish, he's broken down into this very cool looking serpentine lightning bolt that darts around the screen before cutting to some subtle character acting as Universe 6 is revived. I'm not 100% sure who animated this, the shapes do remind me quite a lot of Chu Yong Sir's work, but with Kyoto Washikita also listed someone very capable who I don't really know much about, it's hard to attribute this scene to anyone with real confidence. The main bulk of the episode wraps up with some of the loveliest shots of the various universes, and I think much like the first half stellar direction, this really sums up Ishitani's commitment to have every element of this episode finely crafted around what each scene means. 
but each universe looking up into the darkened sky with the ray of light shining through, the symbolism is immediately obvious. We've been plunged into darkness in this tournament for the past 34 plus episodes, with the fate of the universe is all on the line. To have the light return once again is really powerful imagery, and I think it's most effective when Jiren looks up into the skies and literally watches this light carve out the darkness. For him, it's not just that the universe is safe, but it's that he made a bond with someone for the first time since his own darkness in childhood. This board and direction just works on so many different levels. Like I keep saying, it looks beautiful, but what that beauty actually says is what's most effective. As the opening song begins to play, this is pretty much where Tadayoshi Yamamoro's supervision ends and the assistants take over. The two that matter the most here are Takeo Ide and Koji Nashizawa. The majority of these ending stills are by Hiroyuki Itai, and I'm sure if you're familiar with him, you'll recognize those long jaws and high ear placement. However, the standout of this section does seem to come from Chiyong Sir, and I'm pretty sure about this one. He animates the awesome bit of character acting as Pan flies into Vegeta, leading to Goku laughing and the two starting to fight. Every character feels so alive and the lightning effects as they transform look lovely. This is also the clearest look we get at Takeo Ide's corrections. As we move into the ever so familiar wasteland for a neat callback, we get more Itai, but Koji Nashizawa's corrections are also clear to see before Takeo Ide pops in once more and partially corrects Itai before they charge at each other and the episode ends. As I'm sure you know, I have very complex and not too positive feelings about this arc as a whole, but for me this was a near perfect way to wrap up everything they'd established throughout these past 60 plus episodes. Even for someone not emotionally invested in the story, this episode managed to hit like a sledgehammer and I don't think I could have asked for anything better. It's very clear based on the ending narration that Super will be back soon and I think they left things on a perfectly optimistic note that should lead suitably into the future content. I just want to take a moment to say a personal thank you really. I have been a fan of Dragon Ball since it first debuted on UK TV about 18 years ago now, but only really got engaged in the fandom about five years ago when I joined the Kanzenshu forums. Growing from that point, creating the animation catalogue thread and eventually moving onto YouTube has been a really crazy experience and the support I've received has been astounding. Animation and behind the scenes content is such a niche subject in reality, but the Dragon Ball community has welcomed me with open arms and absorbed so much of what myself and many other animation fans have had to say over the past few years. It's almost impossible to enter an online discussion about an episode without someone bringing up the animators or the writers by name, and that's such an awesome thing to see. You really don't see that for too many other anime. They're generally only spoken about in terms of studios as a whole. So again, Thank you so much for taking an interest. This might be the last of Super, but it's certainly not the last of me. I still have episode 6 to 64 of Super's cover, not to mention the movies and all other kinds of interesting content, so be sure to stick around if you're interested in diving into other aspects of the franchise in the same way that we've been doing with Super. There have been a lot of requests to touch on other anime, so I'll certainly do my best to try and throw in some variety along the way too. It's going to be a very fun ride into the movie's launch in December and the inevitable new series and I cannot wait to cover each and every detail. As always, be sure to rate this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if everything covered today sounds interesting to you, and while I won't see you in the next episode, I will most definitely see you in another animation breakdown soon. Farewell super, but it's not the end for us as a whole.